Okay, so how's everyone doing tonight? Thank you for coming out on a Friday night at 7 o'clock. This is going to be a, one, of my, uh, one of my most fun talks to do because we're talking about intelligent design tonight. So who's heard of the ID or the intelligent design movement and the ideas behind ID? So it's incredible, you guys. There have been people that have taken apart uh, a motor that's part of a bacteria called the bacterial flagellum. And if you look at that little tiny motor that's on a little tiny microscopic bacteria, it screams creator, it screams designer. It's quite obvious that someone really, really intelligent made that little part of a bacteria. But you know, if you're ministering to people and you're sharing with them, wow, look at this cute little bacteria and how it's got this motor in there and it's got a stator and how it stays charged all the time and it spends 100,000 RPM. But if you don't connect that designer to the God of the Bible, I would stand here and say you're wasting your time. Because Romans 1 says that God has put in the hearts of people that they understand and they know down deep that there is a creator. So if you can help them to that awareness to, to get them to realize that there is a creator, my encouragement to you is to, to take that next step and encourage them that the, the creator that they've just realized is there who created the bacterial flagellum is the God of the Bible because it's only the God of the Bible who's proclaimed all the things that he's proclaimed he even brags about the eye and the ear God himself says the hearing ear and the seeing eye I made them both why would God say about that he wants credit he wants the glory and he deserves the glory for for designing us so that's kind of a quick overview about the, the, the theme of our talk tonight. And with that, I will dive right in. So there are five different chapters about our ministry. We're located in Folsom, California. Uh, the first is that we do a lot of movie production. I won't go into all of these, but they're available free uh, tonight on the back table. We have several different movies. Uh, we have a, a, a pretty significant footprint on social media. We have about 120,000 YouTube subscribers. So we'll be putting out this video on YouTube uh, later on this week uh, with about 11 million views. Our, our channel gets about 30 to 50,000 watches every month, which is really encouraging. Uh, we do a lot of ministry work in Christian schools. We speak at William Jessup and Capital Christian and Providence. So Dave was up here doing a school up here with you guys, which was great. Uh, we give a lot of local church presentations like this as well. And we have an annual conference called the G1 Conference, which is where I think I met your, your youth pastor. So, um, Fantastic. That's a little review about our ministry. We have two primary offerings based upon the age of your student. The first uh, it can be, both of these can be downloaded for free. You can go to debunkevolution.com. And the way that we assembled that program, which is ideal for fifth to 10th graders, is we took the, the life science books that are typically used in junior high in, in public school and the high school biology books, and we extracted or kind of pulled out the top 10 themes of evolution and then developed a scientific rebuttal and a biblical perspective on all of those top 10 lines of evidences. So we've queued you up and got you ready for what your kids are going to encounter if they're going to public school, what the evolution teaching that they're going to get, and then we've rebutted it from a biblical and a scientific standpoint. And then before your high schooler goes off to college, please put them through our seven myths program where we take the top seven false teachings that they're likely to encounter in college about like things like the days of creation or Noah's flood, uh, mo you know, the ideas that Moses really didn't compile or produce the Torah, all kinds of things that they're likely to encounter in, in the secular colleges as well as some Christian colleges now, nowadays. So you can put them through that program. Uh, probably our most widely distributed book, which is also free tonight, is called Answers to the Top 50 Questions about Genesis, Creation, and Noah's Flood. Uh, every year our ministry receives literally thousands of questions through our email channels and Facebook and YouTube and everything. And so we took the top 50 most frequently asked questions that we get asked over and over and over again and wrote a book answering just those top 50 questions. And many of those uh, questions also have videos that you can access from that book. And then if you're a mobile phone person, uh, which is where students are nowadays, they spend an average of about 6.7 hours a day on their phone, they can download our Genesis Apologetics mobile app uh, th either through the iTunes store or Google Play. We have about 100, uh, 120,000 in installations of that program so far, and it, it plums right into our leading videos on YouTube, so you can scroll through and watch any creation evolution topic you want right on your phone. 
Then one of our most exciting things is we're finally coming out with our first theater-released movie that will come out in about a year and a half on Noah's Flood. Uh, we're working with Ralph Stren, who is the director and producer of Genesis Paradise Lost. Has anyone seen that movie? Genesis Paradise Lost, it's a great movie. It's currently number four on Christian cinema. That's of all Christian movies, not only just creation movies. Ralph did a great job with that, and he's now gonna be using some of the same technology to produce what's going to be the most photorealistic reenactment of Noah's flood ever done in history. I think that's our ambition to do. We wanna show you from a, a Disney level, Hollywood level, incredible realistic graphics show you exactly what happened mechanistically uh, during Noah's flood. And we're gonna have a, a very strong gospel element as well in that movie. So that will be coming out in July 2023. Uh, Fathom's already given us a verbal on that, so they're committed to bringing it into about 900 theaters nationwide. And you can get our book that's gonna be released with that movie called The Ark and the Darkness. It's also on the back counter there free tonight. And uh, so let's just dive right into the talk. So uh, there's a lot to be said from Romans chapter one. It's probably the theme chapter from the Bible that we're gonna look at for this talk. So I wanna go ahead and just read this chapter. And, uh, and then we'll apply it to where we're going tonight. So Romans 1 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to become wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. So this chapter is quite obvious that there's, there's been a shift. There is a shift between uh, those who have been awakened to the truth of creation or following Christ and the people who have not, who are darkened in their understanding. And it says that professing to be wise, they are going to become fools and they change the glory of an incorruptible or an eternal God creator into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So there's gonna be a shift there. Instead of worshiping the creator, they're gonna worship the creation. And in worshiping the creation, what they're really doing is they're attributing their ancestry and their origins to the creation and not the creator. I can prove this. Here's what's happening right now in secular evolution. They have attributed our ancestor to Schrodinger. This is Schrodinger, and this is the mammal-like creature, the rat-like creature that they believe humans evolved from some 60 million years ago. They believe that Schrodinger and all of the little uh, creatures like that somehow survived the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs, they say, about 66 million years ago by crawling about two feet underground. He found a hole, he got lucky, crawled underneath ground while all the dinosaurs were getting roasted by the asteroid and all the aftermath, and it survived and somehow led eventually to uh, ape-like creatures that were on all fours, then the ape stood up and walked on two legs and turned into different uh, sequences of apes that led to Homo sapiens finally, and that's why we have mankind here uh, today. So that's the idea of human evolution. And if you go to the Smithsonian at the Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C., you can actually see Schrodinger enshrined in gold on an altar. So this is public tax-paying dollars, and we have this huge altar. As you kind of walk here on the slide, you can see it. They've got three big pillars. And on the other side of each of these pillars, they have uh, a progressive tree of life that looks like you went from the goo-like creatures to the zoo-like creatures to the me and you-like creatures. It's about 12 feet tall. Then if you walk right into the middle there, you can see an altar, and embossed in gold in the middle of that altar, is the creature by, by its scientific name that they believe that we evolved from. It's an embossed in gold. So what is this? This is a manifestation of Romans 1. They're worshiping the creation and four-footed animals exactly like the Bible said that they would. 
and it's right here in Washington, D.C. So that's the condition of what happens to people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They grow a darkened understanding. In exchange for that, God's going to say, you're going to have a, a long, slippery slope. You're going to go down a, 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 an immoral road eventually, and you're going to worship the creation and not the creator. So the first thing I want to show with respect to, to looking at the God of the Bible is, is a very obvious thing, but we could spend literally all night on just this one point, and it's simply this, that earth is obviously designed for life. It's a special creation. For God even says, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed it, the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. So when you look at our galaxy, we can see all the planets spinning around. Do you, do you know you can't change anything with respect to what I'm showing you right now? You can't change the planets. You can't change the order of the planets. You can't change how far separated they are from each other. You can't change the speed of orbit of any of the planets. If you do any of that stuff or move them a little bit closer or a little bit further away, you don't have life on Earth. You can't have gravity. You can't have sun. You can't have seasons. You can't have darkness. You can't have the temperatures that are deal for life. God has divinely orchestrated only earth to be inhabited. None of these other planets are inhabited, but we are intimately uh, dependent on the orbiting and the spiraling nature of all the other planets that are in our solar system, because if you start changing around anything, you're, we're either going to freeze or fry or have no seasons. And you know, a lot of people are extremely worried, worried these days about climate change, but you know, and in Genesis chapter 8, when all the people and animals are getting off of the ark, God puts the rainbow in the sky as a covenant, and he says, as long as earth exists, you're always going to have seasons, and you're going to be able to seed and farm. You will always have springtime and, and, uh, and harvest and winter. God says, you're always going to have the seasons, and you're always going to have a habitable earth that you can farm with. So yeah, we're, we might be seeing some changes, of course. You can follow the statistics and, and look at that. But God says, look, as long as the earth is going to be around and you're going to be on it, it's going to be habitable, which is quite encouraging. The next thing that's quite obvious about the Bible and, and, and God of the, the, the God of the Bible is that he's got the idea of, of, uh, of uh, no, let's say, non-vertical evolution cornered. God created these animals after their kinds. The Hebrew word is bara, mean, or created kind. And in ten, over 10 times in Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter of the Bible, God uses that term 10 times to say, I created them after their kind. They're going to reproduce after their kind. The, the trees are going to reproduce after their kind. The animals are going to reproduce after their kind. So God set up these categories or families of, of plants and animals that are only going to reproduce after their kind. And that's exactly what we see happening today. So let's look at number two. So God of the clever design. We're going to take a quick th tour through two different creatures that, are, that reflect God as the amazing designer. We're going to look at, take a look at the largest creature ever discovered and one of the smallest creatures that really reflects design. So the first one is a sauropod dinosaur. There are lots of these creatures that have been discovered. There's Argentinosaurus. There's a Diplodocus, which is a little bit smaller. Um, but they all have the name in Job chapter 40. God calls this line of, of creatures behemoth. He says, con, you know, Job, consider behemoth, which I made along with you. It's the first of all of the ranked creatures I've ever made. It's the first, the biggest, the baddest terrestrial land-dwelling creature I ever made. Then he goes on to explain 14 characteristics about this creature. It's one of the long, it's the second longest description of any animal in the entire Bible. And God goes on and on and on for 14 characteristics describing it. And it says, well, it's got a tail that sways like a cedar tree. And God says, by the way, consider behemoth, which I made along with you, like on the same sixth day of creation, because we know that Adam was given dominion charge over all of the animals, and he named all of the animals. And when Adam and Eve fell, all the animals and creation fell along with us. So this creature was was put underneath Adam. He had dominion over it. And then things, of course, changed after the, the, the sin came into the world. But God goes on and says, well, a raging river uh, does not alarm it. It is secure, though the Jordan should surge into its mouth. 
And God continues and says, well, it's going to have ribs like bars of iron. And did you know that in a large sauropod dinosaur, its ribs are fully ossified, which means they're concrete bones. They're not hollow on the inside. And God continues and says, well, it's going to have bones that are tubes of bronze. And sure enough, if you look at a giant femur bone from a sauropod dinosaur, it's hollow on the inside and hard on the outside. Otherwise, you'd have some serious weight problems. God says it's the, the sinews of its thighs are going to be close-knit. And God says, look what strength it has in its loins, what power in the muscles of its belly. So why would God point that out if he's not talking about a gargantuously large creature? So here are the 14 characteristics. Um, but if you just zoom in and look at number eight, that's really the telltale sign. God is saying this is the chief then the Hebrew is connoting a ranked ordinal list. God is saying, this is the number one thing I made, the biggest thing I ever made. And God's saying, I want, I, you know, I, I deserve the glory for that. And other features like he's swaying his tail like a cedar tree. He can stand in a river and he's not going to be disturbed and the Jordan's going to gush in his mouth. But number 14 is also very interesting where he says that he's unapproachable by anyone but his maker. So let's just play in a little imaginary game and say, okay, we've got a behemoth out here, and it's right out here on, on Highway 5. Well, behemoth, the largest ones discovered are 122 feet long and weigh over 70 tons. They span six freeway lengths. So if you've got a behemoth out there, a huge sauropod dinosaur, and he's on I-5, and he's spanning all six freeway lengths, if I-5 really had six, I think it's only got two, but he's spanning six freeway lengths, and he's standing up there, and you had a spear or a bow and arrow, and there was a hundred of you, and you wanted to try to get close to this thing, it's impossible. Its tail alone is 40 feet and weighs over 10,000 pounds. All it has to do is walk around in a circle, and it's got a 250-foot kill zone. Nothing can come close to it. So, and that's why God's saying he's unapproachable by anyone but me. I'm the only one that can get close to it. So, in some Bible study notes that, wanna, that don't want to fit dinosaurs in the Bible will say, well, maybe it's a hippotamus, or maybe it's an elephant, or maybe it's a crocodile. But those descriptions really don't fit. The only thing that fits this creature as described in the Bible, the only thing that fits all 14 characteristics is a sauropod dinosaur. So here's what its femur looks like. Look how large that bone is, and when it's uh, th that uh, leg bone, and when it steps down, that's what its footprint looks like. That's probably the largest footprint ever recorded, a huge sauropod dinosaur footprint, probably, I don't know, 10, 12 times bigger than an elephant's. There's what the leg looks like when it stands up. We're talking about an amazing designer here. We're talking about a 70-ton beast that's 120 feet long. Here's one animal that's in the sauropod family called the Diplodocus, and I want to zoom in here in a minute and take a look at its neck. Can you take a look at its neck there real closely? We'll zoom in, and you see those little hanging bones that, that are they're called double-boomed double, uh, chevron bones, and these are little bones that are right below its neck on its big, tall, long neck. They have these, these double bones that are hanging down, and they're a perfect link, link, linking, connecting points for the tendons, the muscles, and the ligaments. And without these flexible chevron bones, it would look down and fold its neck in half and choke to death and die. Its trachea and its esophagus are protected by these ratcheting chevron bones. Amazing, amazing designs. Now, there's one, um, one expert that studied these, uh, these, these sauropods. He's got a whole book out, Dr. Waddell, on just sauropods. And what he's noticed is that their, their necks are actually like the boom on a huge crane. And if you look at this, the design feature of a crane, you can see how similar they are. You have to have scaffolding ever so often. And do you know that the higher you go up in its neck on its vertebrae, the lighter and lighter the vertebrae get. By the time you get to the top, some of those vertebrae way, way up at the top are almost totally pneumatic, which means they're filled with air. So the, all the way down the base, you've got some solid vertebrae, but the higher you go up, some of the vertebrae at the top are 90% filled with air. They're like honeycomb, like styrofoam. 
And the other thing that's interesting about its size is it's so long, 120 feet, that it's got compression and tension loading. You can't have a long neck without a long tail to off balance it, and you can't have a long tail without a long neck. So doesn't this just scream design? It screams engineering. I mean, it's got the same engineering that people put into a suspension bridge and a crane with a boom on it. It's incredible, incredible design. Here's one of its vertebrae. The largest vertebrae that they've discovered in these creatures is four and a half feet. That's one vertebrae, a four and a half foot vertebrae. And sometimes in their tail, they'll have more than 50 vertebrae. And here's what it looks like on, on the side. As I mentioned, they're what's called pneumatic. And I'm gonna fly in some, some yellow graphics there on the, on the left. You can see all of that is air pockets. So the rest of it is spongy and hollow like styrofoam, so it would be able to lift up its neck. So again, we have amazing design. And we also find some, some features of this creature that show it's perfectly matching to the biblical text. Verse 17 in Job 40 says that he moves his tail like a cedar tree. Uh, the sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. So check this out. Dr. Waddell has discovered, based upon the linking points of the tendons, tendons in the muscles, of its backside of its femur and its tail vertebrae, that they're connected in such a way that as it was walking, it had to sway its tail. And they typically don't find big slide marks of this creature's tail in the dirt behind its footprints. It's always carrying its tail up in the, up in the air. So when it's walking, it's gonna have to sway its tail like you see in the picture here. As some people have taken models of a diplodocus tail and put it up, hooked it up to machinery, and they've flipped it like this with, a, with a, a big, huge pulley, and they've shown that this big 20-foot-long tail can actually break the sound barrier at its tip. So it would be, be just like cracking a whip, and it accelerates to 700 miles per hour at the end. Could you imagine what kind of a defense mechanism that would be? How'd you like to be whipped? by a 5,000 pound tail moving 700 miles an hour that could whip, make the crack like a, like a whip. So it would be amazing. But here we go, we've got these connecting points. God has engineered this creature and God says, yep, that's the number one thing I ever made. That's the, the chief of the rank. Now let's look at something that's really, really small. We'll take a look at bees. Now, just if you step back and look at creation week, doesn't it seem to make a lot of sense that if God forms the earth in the first three days, and on day three, he creates plants for food, two days later, he creates pollinators. The flying creatures are made on day five. So you can't have millions of years of evolution or millions of years of creation between day three and day five because you can't create all these plants and all the vegetation without pollinators. Some people have done estimates to see how long we would have food sources on Earth if all the bees went extinct. And it's pretty scary. The estimates are not too long. Without bees and butterflies to go around and pollinate things, just doing what God's told them to do, we would not have uh, a, lot of, a lot of fruit around at all. In fact, in some places in China, they have to go around because the bee populations are having a hard time, and they'll take paintbrushes and dip them in pollen and manually have to pollinate all the trees themselves, go flower to flower to flower. All this stuff is happening out in God's nature. So it makes sense to me that the six weeks is, or the six days of creation are six ordinary days because you've got vegetation on day three and just two days later, God puts on earth all of the, tree, the creatures to go around and pollinate everything. How is it that these bees, without being trained by their bee parents, know how to make shapes like this? And did you know that some scientists have studied this hexagonal shape here where they're making all their cells, where they deposit their nectar and their honey? And it's the strongest structure that they can make because the structures press against each other and they can sustain weight. And it's also the, the not only is it that, it's, it's also efficient with respect to how much honey they can store in all of these different cells. Here's what happens with bees when you don't give them a honeycomb. They know how to design a shape that's going to allow airflow. 
I've raised bees before, and do you know that when you go and see bees in the wintertime, the bees will huddle around the queen and then will flap their wings at a certain speed to keep the temperature in the hive perfectly right. And you can have 20 different hives lined up and you can have thousands of bees going out to, to collect pollen and nectar and then they're gonna come back. They know which nest is theirs, which hive to go back to based upon the pheromone scent that their queen is putting out. All this stuff they do without any training. It's programmed in their little tiny brains to do all this stuff. But it gets even better when you zoom in on the bee Take a look at the little hook that it has on its forelimb. It's a little special antenna cleaning notch. So if you look at bees, they're always doing this kind of thing because they're landing on flowers and they're getting all the pollen and everything. They'll take that little notch up, hook it on their antenna and clean it off before they go to the next one. They're systematically designed by God. They've got five eyes, including two compound eyes with 7,000 facets or, or, or lens. They've got an antenna to measure flight speed and detect 170 different odors. And all of this is done from a, a brain the size of a grass seed. And there's no teaching. No one's ever shown that the mommy bees get up all the, the little kid bees and train them. They don't have classes or anything. All this information, these instructions are in their, their minds when they're, when they're born. So their wings can beat 200 times per second. It's just amazing. They've got little pollen buckets on their back legs and everything. It's just an incredible, incredible design. But one of the most magnificent things about bee design is something called the waggle dance. Who's heard of the waggle dance before? Okay, it's incredible. Because when I first learned about it, I'm like, no way, this, this can't be true. I had to vet it out in the scientific literature. And yep, sure enough, they've run studies. The scout bees will come back to the hive and they'll literally dance around in a figure eight and stop at a certain point in the figure eight and buzz their wings. And all the rest of the bees are looking in on the scout bee. And he's drawing a map of where to go to go after the flowers. And he's teaching all the other bees how to do this. So they fly over and so he's got this figure eight shape waggle dance and it's oriented 45 degrees right up to the vertical comb. And they're, they're talking about where the sun is and everything. And they're plotting out a map for the rest of the bees. To, oh yeah, all the, all the great roses and everything, all the great you know, flowers are over in this direction. So they leave the hive and go over there. Just amazing. So could mankind build something like this? We've got pretty advanced drones, we've got miniature drones, and we've got strike drones and all these things that we can do with re remote control. My son's got his drone license and he loves to fly those things around. But I would argue never could man make something like what I just showed you. And oh, by the way, it feeds itself and it can think for itself and it's perpetually powered by flowers. It doesn't, ha it doesn't have to get charged up with a lithium battery. So uh, just, just amazing, amazing design. Number four is that God is an efficient designer without leftovers. And the word says in Psalms 139, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. So here's a, a medical book from 1895 called The Structure of Man, an Index to His Past History. And do you know, as of about 1895, Medical scientists believe that we had nearly 200 vestigial structures in our bodies, like your tonsils and your appendix and all these things. They just thought, ah, oh, they're leftovers. We don't know what purpose they have. They're probably vestigial structures left over from evolution. We all know people have evolved. Darwin set us straight because they're thinking in 1895, and we evolved over millions of years. So we've got all these parts in our bodies that we really don't need anymore. Well, do you know that modern science has now admitted there are zero vestigial structures? They have found purposes for each and every parts of our body. So when I was a kid and going through K through six, I would get strep throat pretty much every year. And a lot of my friends would get strep throat and we'd all go into the hospital. And the first thing that they would do is just cut your tonsils out. Oh, you've got strep throat, let's just cut your tonsils out. We, you don't need those things anyhow. But then later they discovered, oh my gosh, actually our tonsils are part of your lymph system and they provide a first line defense for throat infections. So maybe we shouldn't be cutting those things out. The appendix, which they thought was vestigial for years, they've now learned is a storehouse that keeps your healthy flora together in your body. So if you have dysentery and lose everything in your colon, it re-injects healthy flora into your digestive tract so you can keep eating and getting energized. Amazing, amazing stuff. And things like our tailbones, they think, well, maybe you know, the coccyx is left over, but then we've learned your tailbone has 47 different linking points 
for muscles and tendons and ligaments, and you, you pretty much could not go to the bathroom without all of those things, and you, women cannot give birth without having all those connecting things going on in their coccyx. So it's, it basically scoops up and holds your pelvic floor and holds everything uh, upright where it should be. I asked a friend of mine who's a number two medical uh, supervisor in a huge hospital system here in California. He's a Christian, he's a creationist. And I said, will you tell me, being in the medical field for so long, what's your number one proof for God as a creator, being a, a medical expert like you are? And he didn't hesitate at all. He says, oh, that's easy, blood clotting. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, anytime you get a cut, there's five steps that happen in sequence to stop your blood from bleeding out. And people who have diseases that, that don't ha that have those five steps in the same order that you need them, well, they'll, they'll just bleed out and, and, and die. So I asked him more about that, and we, we broke it down. He says, well, okay, you've got an injury or a damage, then your cells are going to start activating all these different things calling in the clotting agents that are going to come in. Your blood vessel is going to contract, so it's going to shrink down and mim minimize the hemorrhaging. Then it forms a platelet plug and then a fibrin clot. All these things happen automatically without us even thinking about it. But the point is this, you can't evolve these five separate distinct steps because they have to be in order. So every organism that didn't have these five steps from the start would have bled out and died. You can't evolve these five steps. All five steps have to be there from the start. Just uh, amazing, amazing stuff. Okay, so next let's take a look uh, at the Earth and its history and look at a catastrophic flood because again, we wanna connect Earth and science back to the creator of the Bible. And we will take a quick look through Earth's catastrophic plaque, uh, past by looking at Noah's flood. So there's a couple of key verses here. One is in Genesis 7:11, where it says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. So something started on the ocean floor. Then the Bible says that all of the high hills were covered with 15 cubits of water, so about 22 feet of water. And then the waters receded. So the waters came up for about 150 days, then they receded slowly for about 150 days, and then earth dried out for 70 days. So we have a 371 day flood process. And in the 1990s, these six guys got together and figured out exactly how it happened. They framed a theory called catastrophic plate tectonics. We're working with several of these guys to come up with our, our movie. And they, they formed this theory, and we can actually go prove this theory out. Uh, and it's quite obvious by looking at even just Earth maps what happened. So when the fountains of the Great Deep broke open, there's something that happened on the ocean floor. So we have a lot of rifting that occurred, and then we've got linear steam jets that are popping up like this, putting super critically heated water up into the atmosphere that's later falling down as torrential rain. And we know this happened because John Bumgardner has done some great, great modeling with his software program called Terra, where he's done simulations proving the movement of Earth's crust and how it happened rapidly, what's what's called runaway subduction. So the continents didn't drift apart like they are doing today, they sprint apart at about five miles per hour during the time of Noah's flood. You can go to a map or any uh, geoscience book and take a look. You can go see the fountains of the Great Deep even to this day. It's a 40,000 mile rift system. We know where the cracks still are. We know that the water and the magma was coming up from these areas. Just amazing proof that's right out there for anyone to look at. You can look at the one of the biggest ones called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is a 10,000 mile tear right down the middle of Earth there. And we can put these continents perfectly back together and match them before the fountains of the Great Deep came in and catastrophically ripped them apart. And after it ripped them apart, it pushed them apart to now they're more than 2,000 miles separate. So when that was happening, we have seafloor spreading. So we have the magma that's coming up from under the earth. When it hits the water and gets exposed to air, it creates new seafloor, which begins spreading and coming out to the left and to the right. And so here's an animation of what that might have looked like when the magma's coming up. It's generating new seafloor, and then it's spreading and pushing the continents apart. 
And when that's happening, the runaway subduction is occurring. So you've got this, the, this, the newly created seafloor is, is, is diving on the downward, uh, the downward sliding plate, and then you've got the overriding plate. And when it's going down, it will bind and clamp for a while and then release. And when that happens, it creates huge tsunamis and earthquakes that go out in both directions. So here's another animation. You can see the new seafloor being created. It's subducting underneath the land mass. And when that does, it, when it's uh, going to start diving down, it's going to bind as you see it crimping in here. This is exactly what happened in Japan in 2011. The seafloor slipped 60 feet in 2011 when it slipped and created a huge tsunami that came up and did the, the havoc that we watched happen in Japan. You have this going on on a worldwide basis, and it's obvious that this happened because that's how we buried 14 states of dinosaurs in the middle of America. You can drive to Wyoming and North Dakota and South Dakota and, and uh, Oklahoma and Texas. You can see all these massive fossil graveyards that are all throughout this entirely huge area here that's 1,800 miles long by about a thousand mile, miles wide, includes parts of three countries. It's a massive, massive dinosaur kill zone. How did that happen? It had to happen through catastrophic plate tectonics, just like the modeling that I just showed you. The leading theory from evolutionists is that some asteroid came down and hit the Yucatan Valley, called the, the Chicxulub asteroid, which is thousands of miles away from all, where all these dinosaurs are buried under 50 or 100 feet of mud in the middle of America. So how in the world do you have all of this impact going up from something that happened 2,000 miles south coming up and burying dinosaurs under 100 feet of mud in the middle of North America? It does not make much sense. Here's a helicopter shot of where you can see in Montana how deep these mud layers are. They're brought in by tsunamis, they're formed in layers, so you can't have a little asteroid down there blowing up and then causing tsunamis that are going to come up and bury 14 states worth of dinosaurs. It just does not make sense. So there's a simulation. We drop the rock, we see the asteroid land down, it's going to come up and bury some parts of Texas maybe, but it's going to miss uh, most of America where all these dead creatures are. So the asteroid theory does not work. What had to happen is we have to have tsunamis coming in from the Pacific, coming up, flowing over what, what would have been California and coming up and going all the way across the continent, leaving these dinosaurs dead in its track. So we have to have it coming up from the left to right or coming up from the east to the west. These tsunamis are coming up and they're flooding over the continents. In fact, one of these locations called the Tanis location, they've actually determined that they've, they've identified two layers, a couple layers where they believe two specific tsunamis were responsible for them because there's, tsunamis have the, the stage where they come up and then the retreating stage, and they've even determined the direction of the current where the tsunamis were retreating off of the continent. So just, uh, just amazing, amazing evidence for, for the flood. And God specified how this happened in his words. This is why these features line up back to the God of the Bible, because God said, on the same day, all of the fountains of the great deep broke open. And when that happened, he used that as, as a mechanic to get all the, the flooding to happen, to wipe, up, wipe out all the creatures like he said he would. So the other obvious uh, evidence that we have for this is called fossil correlation. So all the continents were once put together in a Pangaea-like configuration, and we have similar species that are now found separated by like 2,000 miles that used to be put together. We can take a look at this in real life with a couple of continents here, and each one of these little green dots that you see here is a fossil bone bed. So it could represent maybe 1,000 fossils or 100,000 fossils, in some cases maybe a million fossils, but every little green dot you see there is a fossil bone graveyard. So let's take these two continents and put them together. And do you see what I just did? Look there on your screen. Those two red ovals are encapsulating what used to be an ancient biosphere where these animals and creatures were living together happily before the Mid-Atlantic Ridge split and pushed these two continents apart going about five miles an hour. We can know this because if you go to the Fossil Works database, which evolutionists use for a lot of different purposes, we can see on Africa and in Brazil, the same types of creatures were living there, but they're now separated by over 
2,000 miles, but you've got brother and sisters and cousins of different types of fossils that used to be living together that were catastrophically ripped apart. So you've got a brother on this side and a sister on this side. How could that have happened slowly over millions of years when you've got the same species now separated by 2,000 miles? It couldn't have been a slow process. It had to be a fast one. Here's some more proof when you look at how the dinosaurs were buried. It's a study called dinosaur taphonomy. So when you start digging up these dinosaurs, you can see the matrix that they're buried in. So dinosaurs in the middle of America are buried in three types of substances, mud, sand, and ash. So whatever happened, when you walk up to a dead dinosaur in Oklahoma and you see it's buried in these three products, mud, sand, and ash, you have to ask yourself, what was going on in the world at this time that would have buried these dinosaurs in those three things and not anything else? Why did it have to be mud, sand, and ash? Well, did you know that the process I just explained with catastrophic plate tectonics explains all three of those products? Because if you've got catastrophic rifting going on and the new seafloor is happening and it's spreading and it's going over to the overriding plate and it's binding and releasing every five minutes and it's causing tsunamis to come up on land in a cycling type of fashion, that's going to bring the first two products, mud and sand. It's going to come up in huge, huge megatons and bury these creatures. And then the subducting plate, when it's going underneath, causes volcanic activity along the coastal lines, spewing out all kinds of ash. Geologists know this happened because you can go in Southern California right now and find a place called the Independence Dyke Swarm. It's about a 400 mile long rift system where we see all the volcanoes were blowing up then and they estimate, secular geologists estimate, it blew up enough ash to cover half of North America. And that's why we have the dinosaurs buried in a snapshot of time when those volcanoes were blowing up back then, but they're not today. So if you have the dinosaurs buried in mud, sand, and ash, something had to be going on back then that's not going on now to bury them in three different products. So I think that's uh, some pretty incredible uh, proof there. Let's move on to number six. And this one, again, we could spend the whole night on. I'm just going to give a very brief overview of this, is the God of, the, of Bible and prophecy. So did you know that there are 43 prophecies about Jesus that have all come true, Old Testament prophecies? We won't look at any of these tonight, but I would encourage you to do research on this. We're talking about very, very specific prophecies, like he's going to be born in Bethlehem, he's going to be born of a virgin, he's going to be of the line of Abraham, a descendant of Isaac, a descendant of Jacob, it even prophesies his birth line and everything. It goes on and says that the children would be massacred in the Messiah's birthplace. All of these things were written about Christ before he even showed up on the scene. So how is it that that we can look at 43 prophecies that are written in, in ancient scripture and they all came true of Christ. That for me proves the God of the Bible is able to forecast the future. So that's just an example, but there's 43 of them. You guys can check these out. I'm, I'm happy to email these slides out to whoever would like. And then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now this has just happened in our lifetime and provides a lot of great evidence about the, the historicity and the validity of, of God's word. So in 1947, this shepherd boy was looking for a sheep, grabbed some rocks, threw it up in a cave, and heard something that sounded like glass shattering. He goes up there and finds 40,000 fra uh, scroll fragments and huge clay jars. It turned out to be the largest archaeological discovery in our lifetime of, of the 21st century. So he goes up there and he discovers all these scrolls. They were kind of sold on the black market for a little while until uh, the right collectors got a hold of them. So now we've analyzed them all and we've identified that they were in fact written before Christ was even born. One of those scrolls is really important to our discussion tonight. It's called the Great Isaiah Scroll. It's one of the seven scrolls that were found complete. It's several feet long. You can go to Israel and check this thing out. And they date it chemically to about 335 to 107 before Christ or paleographically be between 100 and 150 BC. But the key to pay attention to is that this scroll was written before Christ was even born and it was about 2,200 years ago. Now see what we can do with this. Here's the amazing thing. We'll just take a look at this one chapter. 
Here's all the words in Isaiah 53. Don't worry, we're, we're not going to read it, but that's the whole chapter. And did you know that in this chapter, there are about 12 very specific prophecies about the, the death, the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. 12 very, very specific things, like he would not be widely believed, he's not going to have the look of majesty, he's going to be despised and suffer, he's going to suffer for other people's health, or he's going to die for our sins. Pain and punishment would, would be for us, but he's going to take it on to himself. He's not going to respond to his charges. We've got all this stuff recorded in history. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, but he was silent. He didn't bring out his own defense. He's going to be oppressed and killed. He's going to be killed with criminals in his death. He's going to be buried in a rich man's tomb. All these things were said in a book that we can now confirm was written pre-Christ. Before he was even here, we have these 12 very specific prophecies. So here's what we can do with this. So we have the modern Bible of today on your far right. So we can take our Bibles of today. We can go back a thousand years to the Aleppo Codex and we can compare a thousand years worth of translations to see how reliable, uh, how reliably we recorded scripture and translated scripture from today to about a thousand years ago. But now since we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can go back another thousand years to see how reliable the scripture was transmitted and recorded through that thousand years. So now we can go back 2,200 years and see was the Bible reliably transcribed? And the answer is yes. We've got 2,200 years of transcription. It was very re reliably recorded. But we can also do something else. We can take these 12 specific prophecies that were written about Christ that we now confirm were written 125 years before he was even here, and we can validate them against what happened at Christ's death. And you know what we've learned? It's been totally validated because all 12 of those prophecies that were expressly written about the Messiah came true over 100 years after this scroll was recorded. So that's real great proof that the Bible we have today is very reliable and very valid. So when it comes to trusting the Bible, we can now go back across, these, across three of these four written, written copies, and when we compare what we have to, uh, in, the, in the codex to what was written in the Dead Sea Scrolls a thousand years back, what we find is that there was about 10 letters that were different, which were spelling differences, four stylistic changes, three letters were added, and that reflects only 99.4% overlap. So if you look at the chapter again, you see the red word there that Jesus is going to be the light of life and be satisfied. It either says that in the original or we will see the light and be satisfied. Not a significant difference, but can you imagine 2,200 years of translation and that chapter is 99% the same as the original Dead Sea Scroll? proving that whoever was, rely, was, was recording and translating all these scriptures for 2,000 years was doing so in a very, very accurate way. So we have a reliable copy of scripture today. So let's change it up a little bit and talk about the God of the ear and the God of, of hearing and the God of seeing, because God himself proclaims in Proverbs, uh, he says, you know, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, God made them both. So your ear is uh, a composite machine that has five separate components that are bolted together. Let's start with the outside of your ear. It's called the pinna. And did you know that your ear is perfectly designed for capturing sound waves? Because if you take your ears right now and push them back, you're going to lose about 5 or 10% of your hearing. It's going to change. Your ears are designed to capture air molecules as I'm pushing the air molecules around the, the room right now. They're designed to trap and capture sound. It's it's a design thing, it's not by chance. And we go in about three inches deep and we hit our eardrum. It's about the size of a dime that's wiggling back and forth right now as I'm pushing around these air molecules. It's wiggling around and on the other side of that tympanic membrane of your eardrum are three tiny little bones, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup that create a leverage motor that are upsampling my speaking by a factor of 1.7 using leverage. It's mechanical force that got in, uh, installed in there. And those things are attached to your cochlea, which is about the size of a snail and kind of looks like a snail, that is full of, of charged water. 
And so it's a hydraulic system. And as the, 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 your ear bones are pushing on your cochlea, it's upsampling sound again, now by 22 times higher. So the little leverage bones are cranking up the sound 1.7 times. But behind that, you have a hydraulic system upsampling it 22 times more. So now we just left from air, now we're going into water. Behind that, we have a chemical system that converts to an electrical system that goes onto your auditory nerve that wraps around a part of your brain. So when I'm pushing around air molecules, it's heard as speech and understood as communication in real time. Here's the challenge with evolutionists. Not one of those five components of your ear uh, makes sense by themselves. If you don't have all five of them in the order that they're placed, you don't have a machine. But if you do have a machine, if you do have them in, in order like, like, like you do, then you have all five systems working together that demands an engineer. The fact that these five separate components are put together using logic or one sample, one process is going to upsample to the next one, is going to upsample to the next one and convert it from a, 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 a mechanical machine or a pneumatic machine to a mechanical machine to a hydraulic machine to a chemical machine to an electrical machine. How in the world could that come about by chance? It couldn't. It had to be put together by an amazing, amazing design. So, so we're trapping these sound waves. It's converted to a mechanical process using these little bones, upsampling 1.7 times to a hydraulic system by 22 times again, off to a chemical electrical system, and then again to a chemical system. So that's an amazing, amazing design. Let's take a brief look at the eye, and here we go. Proverbs chapter 20, uh, verse 12 says, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. So if you just take one little quick look at the eye here, um, the eye has all kinds of incredible parts. It's got the lens and the equius humor and the cornea and the iris. But if you just look at one part, just look at the lens. Do you know that when you're running around at, at, at dark and you're trying to see something and you squint, you know you're doing that to fold your lens a little bit to create some telescopic focus in your eyes, and it actually works sometimes. I almost passed a DMV test last time without my glasses because I can squint really good and see stuff. So, but it, it, it does work. But let's look at these things called the zonule fibers. Here's your lens, and you see all those little tiny filament strings on the outside, so it looks like a trampoline, and you have all the strings that look like springs on the outside. Well, they are actually springs. So when you're focusing back and forth, those strings, those little microscopic, thinner than dental floss strings are stretching or contracting your lens so that you can focus in real time. So you look in front of your face right now, boom, it just shrunk back, and you look at something far away, it adjusts again. Look at how fast and how amazing that is. That's just one part of your eye called the zonule fibers. Something like that is just not going to manufacture itself. It's amazing, amazing design. Next, let's look at some features in nature that represent uh, a thing that's called irreducible complexity. So here's a little tiny bug, and take a look at its legs. And more specifically, take a look at its little tiny knee joints. I'm going to help you out using a microscope here. What does that look like? It looks like some ratcheting gears, doesn't it? Do you know that this little tiny creature can preload its legs using those gears and then spring something like hundreds and hundreds of times longer than its body length? And if you zoom in even closer, look at that. It's a set of gears inside a little, little microscopic, little, really tiny little gnat creature. Isn't that incredible? When you hit it under a microscope, that demands a designer. Something like that's never going to manufacture itself. And here's where we started. We talked about the bacterial flagellum. When you take a bacteria and look at how it spins its little tail there, about 100,000 RPM, it looks just like an electric motor. It's incredible. It's got a hook, a filament, a flagellum. It's got these rings. It's got a stator motor. It's got all these things so that it can spin 100,000 uh, revolutions per minute. Again, we have an incredible designer. So I saved the tough part for the end, but I think it's one of the most fantastic proofs and evidences of, of the God of the Bible. And we're calling it the God of the lifespan. So this is the last part, and it's the most technical part. So track with me here, because we're going to have to use some statistics to, to, to get there. 
But let's take a look at what the word says. In Genesis 5, it says, Adam lived 130 years and begot a son after his own likeness, after his own image, and named him Seth. And after he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. So we can put how old he was to how long he lived, and that's 930 years total. Well, right there in Genesis 5, we're only five chapters deep into the Bible. Don't we have a huge problem, a medical problem, a scientific problem? How did that guy live to be 930 years? It's almost 1,000 years old. It's 10 times longer than how old we're living today. And it's not just him. It's all 10 of the pre-flood patriarchs are living that long. Uh, even in Genesis 47, ch check this out. This is a very interesting clue. Pharaoh comes up to Jacob and says, oh, by the way, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, well, the days of my years, of my pilgrimage, pil pilgrimage they're only about 130. So I'm only 130 years old, uh, and few and evil have been the days and the years of my life. So I've had a hard life. I'm only 130 years old. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of, they'll, of their pilgrimages. So Jacob's saying, I'm only 130. I don't live as nearly as long as everybody who lived before me. So we have these evidences of long lifespans. Here we go all the way to the book of Numbers. We have Aaron living 123 years. What's going on, you guys? Is the Bible a mythical fairy tale with all these people living this long? Or is there something going out, something else going on that can actually legitimize the, the Bible? Well, here's what's happening. If you plot it all out, we've got over 20 lifespans here, biblical patriarchs that are put out in order. We've got on your far left here, we've got Adam living 930 years, and the longest line you can see here is Noah's grandfather, who lived to be 969 years old, but that's how long they were living before the flood, and then wham, we have the flood that happens uh, under 1,700 years after creation, and then systematically, not off of a shelf, but systematically, they begin an exponential decline off of a gentle slope like this, and, the, and all the way down until they're living 70, 80, 90 years. But it doesn't follow suddenly, it happens along a decay curve. What's going on? Well, Dr. Uh, Sanford, a Cornell-trained geneticist, broke the code. He knows exactly what's going on with these people. A great scientist he even invented what's called the gene gun, which is featured in the Smithsonian, the Natural Museum of American History. Very smart scientist. He nailed what's going on. It's called the biological decay curve. And when you plot these lines out, when you plot these lifespans out, starts really high and then begins a slope that follows down, it's actually called a regression term called a power law curve. So it doesn't just flow down by happenstance, it follows a pattern called a biological decay curve that goes from the top and kind of slopes out like there. And the math is so strong behind it, there's such a, a, a detectable pattern that it's likely to occur by chance in less than one and a quadrillion times. So there's something really statistically significant going on here, and it's something well beyond what this ancient writer could have done having a feather pen writing down using exponential math. There's no way that some ancient writer you know, 3,500 years ago and beyond could have been recording these lifespans to so perfectly follow down a regression curve like this. So Jesus even referred to many of these people as historical. He referred to Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Uh, he talked about Noah's Ark and Abraham and Lot and King David. Jesus referred to a number of these people along this lifespan in ways that were historical. So what John determined is it's called, the, as I mentioned, the biological decay curve, and it works like this. Anytime you have a situation where you've got millions and millions of people like before the flood, and you just grab eight of them, you snatch out of millions of people, just eight people, and you put them on board the ark, so you've got Noah and his wife, and Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives, you've got eight people, you create a genetic bottleneck. You draw from many, you reduce it down to some, and then those eight people get off of the ark and begin inbreeding, and when they begin inbreeding with such a limited diversity in their gene pool, it increases the mutation load in our genes and begins degrading and shortening our lifespans. It's the same thing that would happen if you took, for example, a brother-sister dog and reduced it from their whole family and started inbreeding just those. It'd be one of the reflections 
of a genetic bottleneck like that is shortening of lifespans. And that's exactly what Dr. Sanford determined. And we've got Christ himself referring to these people as real individuals. And do you know that these people are in the lineage of Christ? You turn to Luke chapter 3. We have 70 different patriarchs that are all in the line of Christ. So something's going on now there that confirms that our history that goes back in humanity, which only goes about 6,000 years, which is mapped and referred to in Christ's lineage himself, is historical and true. The reason that they lived so long back there has now been validated and confirmed by science that it's a decay curve, and it's statistically significant, indicating it's not a chance thing, and there's no way that some ancient writer could have schemed to so perfectly reduce their lines to follow along a power law curve that's statistically significant. Stuff like that can't be made up. So you really have only two options with respect to this. Either you have many generations of Bible writers scheming together to slowly shorten lifespans as they're writing and recording these documents and getting in on the lie together for multiple generations. And while they're doing it, using advanced exponential math to decrease their curve, or you have real lifespans that reflect people living a lot longer before the flood when our gene pool, when our gene pool was much more clean, when the effects of sin had not entered in. And we're taking that population, restricting it to eight, they get off the ark, reproduce, and the gene mutation load increases, which is exactly what the statistics reveal. So I think I will end about there, which puts me right on time. But I think what we took tonight is a rapid race through 10 different lines of evidences that connect some amazing statistical things and some amazing geological things back to the God of the Bible. So I'll go ahead and, and end there, and we'll, uh, we'll take some, some uh, questions afterwards.